Good afternoon. It's Friday the 19th of June 2020, just after one o'clock. Welcome to UK Column News. I'm your host, Mike Robinson. Joining me in the studio today is Patrick Henningsen from 21st Century Wire. Welcome to the programme, Patrick. Great to be with you, Mike. Uh, well, good news, Patrick. It is really good news because here is the uh, traffic light system, the DEFCON system of uh, coronavirus for the UK government. And uh, as you know, as of yesterday, we were still at level four, the virus not contained. Uh, but this morning it was announced that we have, in fact, moved to level three. So this is an update from the chief medical officers for England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. Uh, and the information has come from or the assessment has come from the Joint Biosecurity Centre, which, of course, is the, the new intelligence service. Uh, and they have recommended that the COVID-19 alert level should move from level four uh, to uh, level three. Uh, this is just COVID confusion, uh, Patrick, because as you can see on screen there, uh, level three means that the virus is contained, that R is less than one, uh, and it involves a partial lifting of the lockdown, but it doesn't say anything about shops and offices. Uh, and yet we've been opening shops and offices for a week, two weeks, whatever it is, uh, which is level two. So, so, we're, so we're really in two. No, we're in three, but we're really in two. Is that sort of like that? It's, but it's, it's just completely, it's just, uh, a mess. Total, isn't it? total confusion. Total, confusion. total uh, confusion. So completely unclear exactly where we are, other than apparently we've moved from level four. This is just the most extraordinary virus, Mike. It, it changes, it morphs, it has different capabilities, different powers, depending on what time of day it is, uh, where it's at, what country it's in, Mike. The coronavirus is completely uh, amazing in its flexibility and its power. Let's look at some of the uh, confusion, though. Uh, we've just devised this little chart. Here, uh, there he is up there. That's Coroni. He's our mascot, and you can see he's a bit confused, Mike. He doesn't know really what he's doing, but we can we can say that he doesn't thrive. Uh, he doesn't thrive before 5 p.m. This is why the shops are closing earlier, uh, because coronavirus doesn't thrive before five, but after five it thrives. Right. Uh, corporate supermarkets. He doesn't really thrive in corporate supermarkets. It's it's safe but he does thrive in local market stalls. So fruit and veg stalls, small shops. This is where the Coroni thrives the most. Okay, so Marks and Spencer's, completely safe. He's not interested, but independent shops, very interested. It definitely thrives there. So we, those is why there's more restrictions and why they've been shut longer. Bank tellers, uh, doesn't thrive between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. Uh, at so, night bank, it's 1 p.m. At 1 so, p.m., it's a problem. So and that's high. That must be the high point of the day for for the Coroni. Uh, but it but we it does thrive massively in dentists and hairstylists, dog groomers, things like that. Mike, that's why these have all been shut. Uh, Takeaway coffee cups, it, no problem there. It doesn't live on those surfaces, but it does live on banknotes. We're told. Uh, police and plumbers, no problem, uh, but massage therapists, manicurists, things like that, big problem. It thrives massively there, uh, even if they're wearing masks, Mike. And yeah. of course, we, we all know manicurists don't wear masks, do they? Uh, neither do dentists. <laughs> I'm just joking. Of course they do. Social justice mass protests, it doesn't thrive. It, so from a political point of view, this is a very canny political animal. He doesn't really get involved in massive social justice protests, but uh, he does thrive in churches, schools, concerts, and sporting events. So you can see that there's a lot of confusion because he's such a, a crafty little sprite, Mike. Uh, absolutely. Uh, now, uh, yesterday, the live stream, the coronavirus briefing live stream from the UK government was hosted by uh, Matt Hancock, uh, and he had quite a bit to say. Uh, and he began by talking about routine vaccines. So let's have a listen to this. Before I talk about corona vaccines, I just want to mention a very important reminder about other routine vaccines that are there to protect you. Throughout the crisis, we've tried to keep the vaccination programmes for children going, and that has been largely successful. But if you or your child is invited for a vaccination, like MMR, then please make sure you attend. It's very important that we don't fall behind on the vaccinations for other diseases because of this crisis. So, Patrick, extremely important that people continue to get their MMR vaccine. And so he made that statement yesterday afternoon and this morning, Pat, 
Uh, this was in the mail. MMR jab used to prevent measles, mumps and rubella could help protect against COVID-19 by boosting the immune system and reducing the risk of developing deadly symptoms. So my question is, why, why is Matt, Han Matt Hancock bringing this up at this point? I suspect the reason is because people haven't been keeping up with uh, uh, the vaccinations during the period of the lockdown, just as many people haven't been keeping up with other medical treatments during that time. But the government obviously concerned about this. And immediately he makes that statement, here comes the mail, writing to the rescue with an appropriate piece of absolute propaganda. The key words there, Mike, are could help protect. Okay, so there's, it's nothing certain there. There's no science there. This is typical medical propaganda that we're seeing. A lot of this stuff you'll see in the Daily Mail. In fact, this story came out the other day. We don't, we're not going to feature it on this program, Mike, but they were saying that uh, asymptomatics could uh, uh, transmit the disease and that w lungs were being ravaged by Diamond Princess uh, uh, passengers because of CT scans, that they have a study that they've done. Mm. The, when you drill down into some of these stories, there's nothing scientific there. It's just they've done uh, a kind of an associative thing where they've put st stuff together and come to some assumption or conclusion. The media, Mike, is just littered with these types of stories. Um, but Patrick, I'm particularly lucky because I'm old enough now to be con to be uh, placed in the prioritization group for the future vaccine. Um, so uh, plans have been published for the vaccine program uh, and uh, there are going to be two groups prioritized, uh, anybody over 50 and uh, those who are in vulnerable categories. So that's fantastic stuff. But the question here is Matt Hancock saying that he would leave no stone unturned in uh, finding a solution to the coronavirus problem. Uh, but he seems to be pretty keen to leave stones unturned with respect to uh, hydro, uh, hydroxychloroquine. And uh, we have an article on the UK column website here now, uh, the hydroxychloroquine scandal. I absolutely urge people to read this. It's a fantastic article by Ian Davis uh, and share it as widely as possible. And one of the key points that uh, Ian is making in this article, of course, is that there seems to have been a global attempt to demonize this uh, drug, uh, which is out of patent and therefore not much profit to be made in it. Uh, the people that advocate its use advocate its use as prophylactic, so it's there as a preventative, uh, and it should be taken as a preventative medication before the major onset of, of illness. But the trials that have been run, which apparently seem to uh, result in the thing being discredited, have been given in high doses to people that are already extremely ill on ventilators and so on. And Ian highlights uh, the recovery trials in particular, uh, and what he's saying is that it isn't really clear of what the obje objective was in the, in these trials. And the reason that is because he said 100, across 175 UK hospitals, 1,542 patient participants in these trials were given 2,400 milligrams. This is six times the recommended maximum dose in the first 24 hours of hydroxychloroquine. And this was followed up by 10 days at twice the recommended maximum dose of 800 milligrams. He said it, didn't, it isn't really clear what the objective was. This wasn't so much a trial of effectiveness. It looked more like an experiment in toxic poisoning. Uh, it would seem to account for the atrocious mortality rate. And, you know, we, there are some major questions to be asked over the way that some of these trials have been, have been run. Uh, and what the, the, one of the questions has to be asked is, have they been run in that way with the intention of discrediting hydro, hydroxychloroquine as a, an effective treatment or a, prevent, a preventative uh, treatment um, with a view to, to ushering in the vaccines? And they withdrew the paper from, from the Lancet, Mike. That's that, all in that article, that, absolutely. That was historic as well. So it's really discredited that story. But the headlines were already made before the paper was withdrawn, Mike, and that that negative campaign against hydroxychloroquine was kind of advanced through that. In America, it's become a political issue because Trump put it on the agenda early, then it became a Trump drug. Yes. And so the media attacked hydroxychloroquine and, and then promoting remdesivir uh, from Gilead Pharmaceuticals. So it, be, and it was obvious at some point, Mike, that they're trying to submerge a cheap, uh, easily effective available drug in, in to substitute that with a, a big pharma, more expensive treatment that might not be as effective. It, totally political, totally corporate. Okay, so uh, Matt Hancock had more to say about vaccines. I'm sorry to do this to you. There are gonna be three short clips from Matt Hancock here. It's never pleasant to listen to him, but let's listen to what he had to say. 
During the pandemic, we've put the stringent measures in place to protect people who are getting vaccinations. And in the long run, the best way to defeat this virus is, of course, the discovery of a vaccine. And since the start, we've been supporting the most promising projects. As of this week, the imperial vaccine is now in the first phase of human clinical trials, and AstraZeneca has struck a deal for the manufacture of the Oxford vaccine. They're starting manufacturing now, even ahead of approval, so we can build up a stockpile and be ready should it be clinically approved. Patrick, this must be unprecedented. I've never heard of this before. This is a vaccine which has not been approved, the AstraZeneca one. This is the joint effort by AstraZeneca and Oxford University, which has been receiving a lot of UK government money. If you look back through the last uh, few UK column news uh, reports, you'll find us covering this. So they've been in receipt of a lot of government money. Uh, AstraZeneca, what have they done here? They've done a deal, he says. What kind of deal is this? Is the government paying for these vaccines from AstraZeneca, whether or not they are effective? Um, we can have a discussion about whether what the chances of them being effective are. But since when did a commercial organization, which is for profit, make a drug before it was approved, in mass, in mass produce a drug before it was approved, in order to have stockpiles available? My question is, is it because they've been assured that approval is guaranteed and therefore there's no risk for them? Or is it because they are uh, absolutely being paid for these, uh, whether the approval is awarded or not? Uh, either way, that's a pretty disgraceful uh, set of affairs, state of affairs. The inference by my, my Hancock, Mike, is that uh, we don't have any time to waste. This is such an emergency that we need to stockpile these in advance of you know, approvals. And I don't know, did they even do animal trials? They skipped animal trials altogether, didn't they? That's right, yes. Right, so they put it out into the population already through the people who have been tested on. It's already, it's technically the virus, whatever they've injected with, Mike, it's going, to, it's going to be out in the population before it's out on release, basically. With animal testing, you have much more control over that sort of situation. So they're already breaching a number of protocols with regards to safety and testing mm -hmm. on vaccines and pharmaceuticals. And so the, the assumption right up at front, the first statement by Hancock was the best way to defeat the virus is with a vaccine. Who is Matt Hancock to make a statement like that? First of all, knowing that there has never been an effective coronavirus vaccine in history. If there had, they probably would have already invented it by now. The flu shot isn't exactly a success story. It, it seems to be a repeated failure year after year. And there are studies, there are academic studies, there are medical studies that show there is a correlation between uh, increased illness and getting the flu shot mm. in many cases. So with all of those problems, wouldn't you be more cautious or at least more reserved about this kind of fait accompli of a coronavirus vaccine? Oh, we put so much money and energy into it and so many different people are working on it, Bill Gates told us this months ago. Mm. Uh, is, does that all of a sudden make it more viable as, as, a, as a conclusion that's going to be effective and it's going to be safe? It, it depends whether your intention is to save lives or whether your intention is to make profits. Uh, and uh, it's certainly viable from the profit point of view. Uh, I'm not so certain about the save lives point of view. So I really do urge people to, to share that, uh, that hydrochloroquine article from the column website. But this, this statement by Hancock should be a scandal. This should be a massive scandal. The papers, the press should jump all over this that he actually said that. He said, we're mm. stockpiling them before it's been approved. Mm. But, but, but they're not. They're and, not questioning and, and, it at all. Last thing I'll say, what is the urgency? What is the urgency? The virus is on its way out. Elvis has left the building. Uh, it's a seasonal virus. Um, the majority of the population were never at any serious risk. It specifically targets one specific demographic overwhelmingly, which is elderly with multiple comorbidities. And within that demographic, specifically targets nursing home residents so far. So the, the general population, children, middle-aged people, teenagers, 20s and 30s, were never at any serious risk of hospitalization uh, to the coronavirus. In fact, Mike, for the, for the younger age groups, and John Ioannidis from Stanford University, Dr. John Ioannidis, said that there's more of a threat of the seasonal flu to the younger age groups mm -hmm. than coronavirus. 
which, sorry, I was just Go going ahead. to say that that leads very well into this because because uh, this is perhaps pretty concerning of the shape of things to come. This is uh, from the Netherlands. Let's uh, do a quick translation. Uh, the headline is roughly speaking, because this is just a Google Translate, uh, who will get a place uh, in uh, intensive care in the next crisis and who will not? These, the criteria are decisive. Uh, and so what's this about? The Royal Dutch Medical Association uh, is, has come out with a proposal to introduce age discrimination in medical care. So if you're talking about the demographic most susceptible to this being the elderly over 80s, uh, of course, the people dying in care homes were dying because they weren't getting any medical treatment at all, but as well. As well. Yeah. But nonetheless, uh, if, if the people we're talking about is, is that demographic, then what's happening in the Netherlands seems to be uh, that uh, uh, those people will be uh, have their medical care rationed. Um, so the Federation of Medical Specialists uh, chairman, Peter Paul van Bentham, said the ethics uh, people have made the choice for us. Uh, we'll deal with pe patients from a purely medical standpoint, but uh, who, who, with, who is going to get, uh, to get access to that uh, medical treatment? So effectively, this is a euthanasia policy. This is death pathway policy. Uh, by fiat, right? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, so will that come here? Probably. Well, you, some might say, Mike, that it, administratively, it already did. It already did yes. Administratively. Um, absolutely, but uh, Patrick, what about the chances of a second wave then? Well, if you look at any of your news feeds over the last, say, three or four days, you'll see it's absolute second wave hysteria. We've just done a shot here of the top searches on this particular story. You've got the BBC, of course, Notice the BBC brandishing the Chinese men in hazmat suits with uh, landscape leaf blowers that have been repurposed to disinfect the walls and buildings of, uh, I don't know, the street, because uh, corona could be on the side of the paint job on the side of that building. So 27 neighborhoods, this is a key word, Mike, 27. There were 27 new cases that caused the new second wave in Beijing, one of the biggest populated cities in the world, but 27 cases showed up and it was the second wave already. So that's, sorry, that's 27 cases in 27 neighborhoods. That's one case per neighborhood. Something that's, like that. That's pretty dense. And then China raced to contain a second wave and then Al Jazeera back to where we were. Beijing fears a second wave of the coronavirus. So a complete overreaction here. And uh, we'll, we'll move on and just see the, how the coverage looks on this. This is uh, Sky News, of course. Never let a good crisis go to waste. Coronavirus China fears new COVID-19 ripple will lead to a second wave. So no talk on all of these about deaths. It's all about cases, cases, cases. If you watch the media, you look at the chattering classes on social media, cases. Everything's about cases, not deaths. And as we pointed out in previous uh, uh, program, Mike, Dr. Sunetra Gupta from Oxford University, one of the top epidemiologists in the UK, at the top of her field, she said, this is a really difficult number to be basing anything mm -hmm. on, which is they call cases or infections. The word case makes it sound like it's a case, it's a serious case, mm -hmm. but it could be someone who tested positive for coronavirus. So, but deaths, that's a more reliable, at least even with all the chicanery and all of the um, uh, amping up and over-exaggeration, overblown death figures mm -hmm. in the UK and the US, uh, by the reporting that uh, systems that they're using. Even with that, Mike, it's still a more reliable figure in mm -hmm. terms of what is the level of the emergency, what is the level of the threat. With regards to cases, now the more testing we do, the more asymptomatics you find out, the more people have it, the lower the infection fatality rate, the death rate goes overall. I know that sounds counterintuitive to hysterical mob, but it's actually true. Um, so you'll see a lot of this in terms of the second wave pushing the second wave theory. So why has there not been a second wave across Europe, Mike? They've been out a lot, been out of lockdown most of these countries for a while, like Denmark. Uh, no second wave. They're even talking about a second wave in Sweden, Mike. How is that possible when they didn't go into lockdown to begin with? But the me for the media, none of these questions matter. Factor in. No. They just run with this uh, campaign, this fear campaign. Absolutely. Well, we'll come on to the media a little bit later. Uh, now, back on the 6th of May, uh, we were talking about uh, the NHS's contact tracing apps. Uh, and uh, well, as we mentioned, of course, these uh, being created with the help of the National Cybersecurity Centre. Code is truth, they said, uh, and they produced a document all about the NHSX app 
Uh, this document is correct at the time of writing, but the system is still in development, so there may be detailed changes before release. Well, indeed, there have been significant detailed changes. We'll come on to that in a second. Now, what was it that they were proposing? Uh, well, they were highlighting the fact that there, that there are two models for uh, contact tracing, a decentralized model and a centralized model. Uh, Apple and Google had begun uh, their efforts as it, with, by creating a, an application programming interface to allow uh, app developers to uh, base their systems on a decentralized model, i.e. that's never talking to a centralized server. Uh, and, but the UK wasn't happy with that. They wanted a centralized server. Um, so uh, we said at the time that uh, this wasn't going to go very well. Uh, and one of the reasons that it wasn't going to go very well was because uh, basically the way that Apple phones work uh, the Bluetooth uh, connection, which Blue these apps are relying on Bluetooth to, to identify if, it's if one phone's close to another. Uh, Apple's phones work uh, by, they, their battery lasts longer by switching Bluetooth off or at least put, set, putting it to sleep when it's not needed. And so there's no prospect of a centralized uh, uh, system working uh, for uh, for the NHS X app. So Patrick, uh, unfortunately, Matt Hancock had to make a statement about the, uh, the NHS efforts uh, last night, and uh, this is what he said. Because of this testing, we discovered a technical barrier that every other country building their own app is also now hitting. We found that our app works well on Android devices, but Apple's software prevents iPhones being used effectively for contact tracing unless you're using Apple's own technology. Right, so it's a real shame. They've had to abandon their plans for the NHS app and go back to the drawing board because they didn't realize what everybody else that was commenting on this at the time had realized that it wasn't going to work. Their entire approach didn't work. So we, uh, we, knew, it, we, we knew it wasn't going to work earlier, Mike, but the government didn't know. No, no. But they How is that possible? Well, they never do with these things. But he, he went on to say that, don't worry, though, uh, that he is going to be, or the government is going to be working with, or they've already made contact with Apple, and they're now working with Apple uh, to, to re-engineer this. Uh, and he said that the main problem was uh, that uh, the, re the reason they chose not to use Apple's uh, applica uh, API, the application programming interface, uh, was because Apple weren't providing a, uh, a robust enough mechanism for discovering the distance between uh, two phones. The distance. So, so he was saying they're going to share uh, the UK government's algorithm for measuring the distance between the two phones uh, with Apple, and they're going to work with Apple to, to re-engineer the NHS app. Unfortunately, Apple doesn't agree that that's what happened. They don't see it that way at all. They say that they have not been consulted in any way, uh, that the, Matt Hancock was basically lying through his teeth last night. Uh, and uh, they said, we don't know what they mean by hybrid model. They haven't spoken to us about it, is what Apple told the Times. So uh, where does that leave us? Well, the, the key thing, Patrick, that ha Mac, Matt Hancock was claiming uh, was that the distance between the two phones was the issue. Um, and so because of this testing, we so I do apologize. What we're saying here now is that this is not a contact tracing app at all. In fact, we can wipe that out. What this is, is these are social distancing apps. These are about making sure that they know that you are maintaining following the social distancing rules, I believe. It's nothing to do with track and trace, really, is it? Because at the end of the day, does it matter whether you are one meter away or two meters away, uh, what really matters is that uh, if, if it's about contact tracing, it only matters whether you're one meter away or two meters away if really you're confirming whether social distancing is taking place. It is a social distancing app at the end of the day. That's how it seems. Uh, but we don't just remind you what he had said before. Of course, it is our civic duty uh, to make sure that we take part in tests and trace and and our civic duty that we uh, install these apps when they come along. Uh, this will be voluntary at first because we trust everyone to do the right thing, but we can quickly make it mandatory if that's what it takes. I remember when he said that. Yes, it was on May the 6th or so. Uh, now, just a quick reminder, of course, uh, the, this is all about intelligence gathering, uh, and at the moment they are already uh, gathering data from various symptom tracking apps because there are symptom tracking apps out there already. Mm -hmm. uh, and that data, of course, going to the Ministry of Defence, uh, J-Hub, 
uh, and then to the NHS for some for symptom tracking. And we were asking at the time, uh, where else is this data going? Yeah, because J-Hub's just just cleansing it. And it's just cleansing it to, to anonymize the data before it goes on to, to, to the NHS. To give it to the NHS, and they wouldn't they wouldn't possibly want to take any of the details of of that app. Why would the military? Want that? Want that? No. Why would the intelligence services want that? They can't, can't imagine. They would never do that, would they? No. Uh, but let's come back to Oxford, Patrick. Well, just a couple of days ago, this story came out, and this uh, definitely caught our eye. Uh, this is the Oxford um, Institute for Evidence-Based Medicine. Uh, they've come out with some pretty groundbreaking research that's really fly, flies in the face of what the government has been saying, Mike. So there is no scientific evidence for the COVID two meter rule. Now, mind you, remember the timing of this, this is early uh, this week. This is what they said. Uh, much of the evidence in the current outbreak uh, informing policy is poor, of poor quality. Encouragement and hand washing are what we need, uh, not formalized rules. And our conclusion is that avoiding contact is very important, uh, that a one meter distance might be slightly better than just avoiding contact, but the difference is unlikely to be much. Uh, these data give no indication that the two meter rule is better than one meter. So again, we see the experts, we see the academics saying one thing and the government is still clinging uh, to their original position. The signs have already been printed, the catalogs have been sent out. We, we've received one recently that was quite entertaining to yeah, look through. Absolutely. <laughs> but again, we're seeing a difference between the UK government and the devolved governments because the Northern Irish government uh, announced today that they are, for educational purposes at least, uh, reducing the uh, distance from two metres to one, one metre. So common sense is creeping for, into for the... Schools, for for schools, well, not for the rest just yet, but for schools. So just after this story is released, the next day the government goes into slight panic mode here, and then Boris basically says, we're willing to cut the two meter rule. We're just working on it now. And if you watch the press conference on June 16th, him and Patrick Valance were going back and forth saying, it's, it's safe to be outside. All of a sudden, and again, this is the amazing thing about the Coroni, it's safe to be outside. They've just told us this last few weeks, it's safe to be outside. Before we were told to be indoors and only go out for an hour a day of exercise. But the disease or the virus has changed in those two months, Mike. It's changed its behavior. This is the incredible thing about the government's position. Uh, absolutely. So where does that take us? Well, uh, related to social distancing, of course, and equally as controversial is the issue of masks. And uh, of course, leave it to Donald Trump to weigh in on anything and make it even more incendiary. This is what Trump said just yesterday. Uh, Trump says he thinks some Americans are wearing masks to show they disapprove of him <laughs> and not as a preventative measure during the pandemic. Uh, so it, a throwaway comment, of course, by Donald Trump, but he does bring up an interesting point. And let's just look back at what the government has said, Mike, watch this short video clip, what the government said just over the last couple of months on masks, mm -hmm. how they've changed their tune. This is what they said previously. Go ahead and roll this when the evidence around the use of masks by the general public, especially uh, outdoors, uh, is, ex is extremely weak. The evidence on face masks has always been quite variable, quite weak, quite difficult to know exactly, and there's no real trials on it. In terms of wearing a mask, our advice is clear that wearing a mask if you don't have inf an infection really reduces the risk almost none, of, not at all. The recommendation from SAGE has been, is completely clear which is that there is weak evidence of a small effect in which a face mask can prevent a source of infection going from somebody who is infected uh, to the people around them. Don't let it happen. It depends on you. It depends on you, Patrick. It does. That, that was a video from uh, keepbritainfree.com, and on that website, if you go visit, it has an amazing video, intro mm -hmm. video on it, but it links also to uh, Simon Dolan's uh, legal challenge to the government mm -hmm. uh, on behalf of businesses across the UK. So I do recommend people go and visit that website and also click through uh, to that, which seems to be something a lot of businesses, small to medium-sized independent businesses, are really getting behind that legal campaign. Mm -hmm by Simon Dolan. Not so much the big corporations, Mike, because I think they're in a different queue. Yes. The bailout queue. 
Uh, so if you have that sort of access to government. No, so on the issue of masks, let's look at this study that just came out. This is from the uh, uh, Journal of Physics of Fluids, Mike, and it's uh, on respiratory droplets and face masks. And what they did is they uh, reviewed a number of different studies, but also kind of co collated a lot of uh, data on this. And for the issue of mandatory masks, this is actually important. And let's look at some of uh, their conclusions here. This, by the way, this image uh, from Boohoo, um, this was quite controversial. It says, if you can read this, you're too close. They've come out with all, all of these fashionista uh, messaging on their masks. It shows you how twisted this whole mask culture is becoming. Twisted fashion, really. But this is what the uh, Journal for Physics of Fluids said. The droplet sizes change and fluctuate continuously during cough cycles as a result of several interactions with the mask and the face. And masks decrease the droplet accumulation during repeated cough cycles. So that's a very important point. And finally, however, it remains unclear whether large droplets or small droplets are more infectious. So totally inconclusive in terms of uh, this idea that masks can somehow protect uh, not only you, but also protect other people mm -hmm. uh, from possibly getting infected from COVID should you cough or should you sneeze or breathe or talk or whatever, shout mm. through your mask. Uh, so totally inconclusive. And, and again, all of a sudden we've seen those U-turn in promoting masks heavily by the UK and by the US government. And of course, other countries are following suit uh, because the, the Anglosphere leads the globalist agenda on most things, Mike. Yes. But uh, let's look at mask, new developments in masks. This is uh, quite incredible. This is a this is a tweet that was just put out by a Professor uh, J. Dip Ray, and we'll look at him in a second, but he says, face masks are here to stay with gusto. Uh, the new Yes Mask, it's called the Yes Mask, enables communication uh, for all whilst reducing transmission. Let us know what you think. Very appealing, isn't it, Mike? She's, she's quite, Delightful. She is quite fetching, especially in her new Yesk mask. So that's a clear plastic uh, veneer there. So, so it is an enclosed mask, but it's clear plastic. Yeah. So there's something not quite right about that. If you've ever seen that movie, The Twelve Monkeys, and uh, before Bruce Willis came up over ground, this is what the people sort of looked like yes. uh, down there. But, you know, so this is the new normal that uh, the professor here is promoting, but we're going to say, no, it's actually the new abnormal. So I encourage people to start using this term, the new abnormal. It's not the new normal. There's nothing normal about people walking around with a getup like that. But let's look at the mask avenger here. This is Professor Jadip. Uh, Ray, he is a deputy lieutenant, South Yorkshire professor of neuro Neurotology, University of Sheffield, great resume here, Royal Society of Medicine. Yeah. Uh, he's got a great resume. So he's saying masks are here to stay, and he's promoting the new bizarre-looking, uh, quite depressing-looking yes mask. I'm going to say no to the yes mask. Yeah, I think we do need say, to turn that into the no mask. Just Thank say you. no just to the yes no. mask. Absolutely. Right, if you like what the UK Column does, you'd like to support us, then please uh, go over to the ukcolumn.org forward slash community. There are options to help us out there and your support much needed, much appreciated. Now, Patrick, uh, I've chosen Surrey Live here, but uh, the entire mainstream press talking about uh, A-level and GCSE results today. These are the, the 16 year old and 18 year old exams, national exams in the UK. Uh, and they're saying that a third of the results uh, that uh, are going to be marked down by the exam boards. Now, of course, uh, what has happened this year is because nobody has been allowed to sit any exams, is that their school teachers have uh, made assessments about what their exams grades would have been. Uh, and those assessments have been submitted to the examination boards and the examination boards will make decisions about whether to award those uh, grades or not. Now, of course, the exam boards have nothing on which to base that other than previous year's results uh, and, uh, and the word of the teachers because the, the exam boards have no knowledge of any of the pupils uh, for whom the data has been sent. Um, so where does this come from? Well, let's have a look at this. This is the uh, FTT Education Data Lab. They say that they produce independent cutting edge research that can be used by policymakers to inform education policy and by schools to improve practice. 
and they produced this a couple of days ago, GCSE results 2020, and look at the grades proposed by schools. And what they're saying is that they, between the 20th of April and the 1st of June, they ran a statistic moderation service, uh, which allowed schools to submit preliminary grades, uh, that those were then analyzed. And in this particular post, they had a look at them and they produced this graph. Uh, and the red dots there show the average grade for each uh, subject from 2019. And the blue dot uh, shows the average grade for each subject from 2020, which is based on the teacher's assessments. Uh, and they are therefore suggesting that uh, the grades are overestimated by the teachers based on that particular data. Uh, they're saying that for computer science, that that was by one, one full grade uh, and that by other subjects, uh, it was less than a full grade, but more than half a grade in most cases. So uh, these are averages, of course. Um, so how is this going to end up for, uh, for pupils? Uh, it's very hard to know. Now, of course, the other fantastic news is that the government has decided to push hundreds of millions of pounds into the education sector to try to uh, make up for the fact that children have had basically lost half their year's education this year. Um, so I think it's, uh, if I remember rightly, uh, 250 million pounds available for, uh, for people to apply for to get one-to-one uh, -one tuition and another 650 million or so going to the schools to provide additional tuition over the summer period, perhaps. Uh, that's one suggestion anyway. Um, so uh, I don't know what your thoughts are, are on this, but, but and really... also money allocated for summer camps, Mike. Yes, summer camps. Well, so, they, they could, the money could be used for that, indeed. Yeah. yeah, social distanced summer camps, of course. It would have to be with the COVID shields and all the sort of PPE gear for the kids. Mike, the point is, wh wh why? Where? Do, where does any of the science say anywhere that uh, children are at risk of COVID nineteen? Where? Where is this? Uh, no, the the the, the argument is. That the children, of course, aren't at risk, uh, but they, uh, the possibility is that they may infect the teacher or they may b pass it between themselves and then take it home to an older parent or grandparent. Mm. Uh, that's, that's the argument. Whether you buy that or not is another question. I would suggest that that's not a, a reasonable argument. A but, remote possibility. Right. Best. So, so why have they not done this in 22 European countries? Why, why have schools been open? Uh, why, why are the kids not wearing protective gear? in 22 European countries. Well, why is Britain different? That it has to keep schools closed and totally fret over every single possibility of health and safety. And if they can possibly open, it's going to have to be with all of these regulations. And so much forth. of it's coming from pressure from the uh, teaching unions. Mm. Uh, and that's, that's actually where, where much of the problem lies with the teaching unions themselves. It's, it's an incredible state of affairs. By the way, last thing is, you know, if they're behind this year, that's not going to put them ahead next year, Mike. No, no, absolutely not. It puts them absolutely behind uh, and next year. And the year, year. after. Uh, and the of year course, after. Uh, and of course, P anybody that falls behind and has to reset or has to, you know, the, the, there may not be places available for them in colleges because colleges are then going to have to try to take two years worth of students into one year. It's, it's, it's pretty, it's going to be pretty difficult. Looking at how they're handling this right now, Mike, my guess is they're going to lower the bar next year and they'll lower the bar for colleges. So overall England or the UK, it's gonna a lowered standard of education going forward. Well, that's been it, the policy for the last 40 years. Well, I don't see any reason to stop now. It's another step down Absolutely. In, in perpetuity. That's not good for competitiveness for global Britain, I would think, right. unless you can just import all of your talent, of course, maybe. Good question. Yeah. Um, so where does that take us? U.S. schools, uh, this is what we're looking at for U.S. schools. The CDC uh, have just issued this uh, guidelines for reopening schools safely, Mike. This is a safe schools report. And we, we scrolled through this and found some interesting things, uh, critical initiatives and activities. And there's a big focus here, Mike, on uh, testing uh, and surve medical surveillance here, testing and surveillance, outbreak control, uh, enabling public health systems, et cetera, supporting existing surveillance uh, efforts, identifying infections, routine testing, personal clinical encounters, et cetera, case investigation. Can you just imagine the bureaucracy, Mike, that this is going to unleash on kids as if they don't have enough on their plate already with mm -hmm. this sort of thing? So this is interesting. So what this document, Mike, spurred on uh, was 
the uh, efforts of one mother. Uh, this is her, her YouTube channel. Uh, and we'll play this uh, a clip from her video and we'll show you her account afterwards. But uh, we'll go ahead and roll this. And this is a response to the CDC guidelines, basically. Okay. This week, the CDC released their guidelines for the reopening of schools across our nation. And while it's important to mention that these are not hard and fast rules that all institutions must obey, these guidelines are being held up as a roadmap for reopening procedures and are, in fact, already being trialed and initiated in many schools throughout the country. The guidelines are being held as a gold standard for operating safe schools. But what do they say? What does a safe school day look like? It begins on the school bus where students will sit alone in empty rows. They will ideally be surrounded by plastic partitions and spread out so that no student has another student sitting adjacent to them or in a neighboring seat. When they arrive at school, they will be greeted by teachers and staff members in masks. They will be encouraged and, depending on age, required to wear masks as well for the entire school day, seven hours or more. Hallways will be unidirectional to discourage social interaction or face-to-face -face connections among students. In the classroom, desks will be spaced six feet apart, and they will all face the same direction as well, once again to discourage social interaction. There will be no recess. There will be no cafeteria. There will be no sharing of pencils, books, or learning games. Backpacks will not touch. There will, however, be regular announcements, reminding everyone to wear their mask, wash their hands, and avoid touching their faces or each other to prevent the spread. The bathroom will have plastic. So, there you go. I mean, would, would, would you want to send your kid to school in that sort of environment, Mike? This, this seems to be quite similar to what is being rolled out in the UK at the moment, absolutely. It's a big sales uh, and marketing uh, push for homeschooling, actually if anything. Uh, let's just, uh, go, to go back quickly, the video, this was done by... This week, the C... Uh, um, Sorry, I've done that again. I do apologize. So this is a mother, uh, Taylor Rain. Uh, she's uh, an advocate for uh, education. Uh, she's a mother herself, of course. She's got some great informative videos. I do encourage people to go check out her YouTube channel, Taylor Rain. She put that video together. You watch the full uh, four and a half minute video uh, up at her channel, Mike. Okay, now let's move on. Um, well, as we mentioned uh, last week, uh, the uh, Monetary Policy Committee of the Bank of England has now met uh, yesterday and they have decided to increase quantitative easing uh, by 100 billion pounds. Uh, so that was pretty much expected. Uh, but they also said that uh, recent data suggests that the fall in global GDP in quarter two is less severe than initial estimates uh, and there are signs of consumer spending and services already picking up, services activity already picking up. So that's fantastic news, Patrick. The economy is going to come back booming, uh, just as the forecasts suggested. Why do I find that highly unlikely? Turn the taps on. Turn the taps on. Just start printing money. Yes. Everything now, let's go back uh, to the other side of the Atlantic. And uh, Patrick, John Bolton has uh, published a book. Yes, or has he actually published it yet? Uh, he well, this is this is the whole point, Mike. This whole point. So here he is, the world's most dangerous, uh, oldest and most dangerous walrus. Uh, here, John Bolton uh, basically put out this book, uh, and right right before the election's about to heat up, uh, basically criticizing the Trump presidency. But the DOJ, the Department of Justice, has moved in to block the book. They filed, a, I think, I believe, a complaint on June sixteenth, Mike, to block the publication of this book. We'll show you. Why? But here's Bolton right now talking in this uh, exclusive interview to ABC. This guy is absolutely amazing how he's able to generate publicity for himself. Mm. Uh, but we'll, we'll go on and look at this here. This is what Trump had to say, and this is a typical classic Trump comment here uh, just a couple of days ago on, on Fox News. In terms of Bolton, he broke the law. He was a washed up guy. I gave him a chance. He couldn't get Senate confirmed. So I got him in on a Senate unconfirmed position where I could just you know, put him in there and see how he worked. And I wasn't very enamored, says Trump. And he goes on. Uh, he broke the law. Very simple. I mean, as much as it's going to be broken, <laughs> this is highly classified. That's the highest stage. It's highly classified information. And he did it. He did not have approval, says Donald Trump. So what he's saying there is really that uh, John Bolton's in breach of uh, the equivalent of the Official Secrets Act. 
uh, in, in the United States. So he is divulging confidential information that's uh, sensitive to national security. Uh, but that first, that first comment, he's almost, almost implying a, I worked really hard to get him into a job. He's not, there's no acknowledgement there that, that he was so desperate to find anybody that was going to take the job in the first place. That's true. That he had to dredge. You know, he was there, he was elected on the idea of draining the swamp. He actually had to, the, the way he drained the swamp was to put them into positions in the administration because he had nobody else that he could employ. Well, anybody that he wanted to employ, this is the point of the whole Trump presidency in the first year, Mike, he couldn't get them through confirmation anyway because mm -hmm. everybody was gunning for anybody Trump put up for any cabinet position. So most of the positions went unfilled early on. Of course, who's, who's waiting in the wings as the old walrus waddle, waddles in, an old Warhawk neocon, and uh, Trump takes him on, and the media love it, CNN loved it, all of the Warhawks loved it, the think tanks loved it. They love Bolton, of course, they love Pompeo because they're, they're tough, they're Warhawks, they wanna start wars and things like that. So yeah, I think even Trump knew that he was gonna be trouble. He, Trump was advised at Mar-a-Lago by uh, Michael Savage, who's one of the top radio hosts in America. He, Trump asked him at Mar-a-Lago before inauguration, uh, he said Bolton was hovering around the buffet table and, Sa and Trump said to Savage, what do you think of John Bolton? And Savage told Trump point blank, he said, he's a snake, he's a liar, get rid of him, you don't want him, he's trouble. And of course, Trump went and hired him eventually uh, because he couldn't get anybody else uh, that the media or the establishment of the swamp would approve of. Mm -hmm. So, but but Bolton's incredible, Mike. How he's uh, been able to be a kind of hero of the left um, because anybody that Trump has an argument with, whether it's John McCain or anybody else, all, becomes an icon of the Democrats and the resistance. So let's look at what they're saying though about the seriousness of it. The National Security Council has determined that information in the manuscript of of Bolton's book is classified, confidential, secret, and top secret levels. So accordingly, the publication and release of the room where it happened would cause irreparable harm because the disclosures and classified information in the manuscript uh, reasonably could be caused, it could cause serious damage and exceptional grave damage uh, to the national security of the United States. So that's quite a serious uh, charge that Bolton's in hot water, could potentially be in hot water. Mm -hmm. I think they will get the injunction on publication. Of course, the left, the, the op political opposition is going to spin that as Trump's trying to cover up this great whistleblowing effort by John Bolton. But anybody who's been following the career of John Bolton knows that everything that's bad in U.S. policy has had John Bolton behind mm -hmm. it, really, for the last 20 years. So uh, absolutely, and pretty cynical to be publishing it right at this moment, as you say, in the run, just as the election campaign is about to heat up. Uh, I, I smell Mitt Romney in the background and mm. this, this crowd as well. Yes. Yeah. Um, okay, well, uh, good news on the UK side then. Uh, Five Eyes have held a summit. Now, the Five Eyes, of course, is uh, uh, an intelligence network. Uh, and, uh, well, who was attending this summit? Well, you can see Pretty Patel there at the top left-hand side. She was the co-chair. Uh, the other co-chair was uh, New Zealand's Minister for Justice, Andrew Little. Uh, Australia's Minister for Home Affairs, Peter Dutton, was there. Canadian Minister for Public Safety, Bill Blair. U.S. Attorney General, William Barr. And U.S. Acting Deputy Secretary of Homeland Security, uh, Ken uh, Chit. Chichinilli, if I pronounced that correctly. Close enough. Uh, and so they were discussing all the threats that uh, we're facing at the moment from an intelligence standpoint, including increased risk of online child sexual abuse, disinformation and hostile state activity. So they're really keen to make sure that uh, online harms are dealt with there. But hostile state activity was an important one. It's a bit coincidental, Patrick, that they're talking about uh, hostile state activity at this a day ago. And the next thing the Australians are shouting about China carrying out a cyber attack, an online, some online hostile state activity against Australia, one of the Five Eye members. So there you go. Just China, a coincidence. Just a coincidence. Uh, China did it, apparently. Uh, and uh, well, let's, that's what Scott Morrison, the... Uh, Scott Morrison, the Australian Prime Minister, he's a great globalist operative, Mike. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. So let's, uh, let's look at this guy then, Peter Jennings. He's from the Strategic Policy Institute in Australia. He said, I'm 95% sure that the attacker is China. The Russians could do it, the North Koreans could do it, but neither of them has an interest uh, in the, on the scale of this. High degree of confidence. 
90, I'm 95% sure the attacker was China. Not directly China, though, Mike. Isn't it through a third party? Or what, what are they, what well, are they they're alleging? Well, they're saying they're alleging that it's, it's, uh, it's state-backed. Uh, oh, so state back. Yes, it's very much the same type of language that we've heard about Russia over the last few years. State backed. Uh, we don't know now. If, like fancy bear and cozy bear. Uh, exactly that type of thing. Now, that, of course, Russia and Australia have been fighting quite a lot recently. Australia accusing China of effectively attacking them uh, by sending them the coronavirus, um, and so as a result. Uh, China got a bit annoyed with this uh, rhetoric and they then stuck an 80% tariff on, on Australian barley exports. Mm -hmm. So that's a pretty heavy uh, bit of economic warfare there. I think it was understandable, bearing in mind the at attitude that the Australians have been taking. Uh, but nonetheless, we have a, a summit of the Five Eyes and the next thing we know, one of the Five Eyes countries is being attacked. What a coincidence, as you say. <laughs> Let's look at China and EU relations then. Uh, because here is uh, Margaret uh, Vestager, who's the uh, who's from the European Commission, uh, and she's concerned about uh, Chinese companies not domiciled in China itself distorting the EU market. So they're particularly talking about uh, uh, two Egyptian subsidiaries of a Chinese fiberglass uh, producer, uh, who, which has been receiving uh, state subsidy from China uh, to, they allege, undercut European competitors. So this is following on from Pompeo's visit to the EU last week, uh, which many people considered as, as an effort by Pompeo to encourage some anti-Chinese feeling within the EU. And we're starting to see the results of that, perhaps. Uh, and then we come on to this, uh, another round of uh, major general level talks between India and China, because of course, yesterday, the day before, was it yesterday, uh, we had uh, this problem on the Indian-Chinese border. Patrick and uh, a number of Indian soldiers uh, killed, including the commanding officer of 16 Bihar Regiment uh, and uh, China being blamed for that. Well, it was the Chinese uh, 20, 20 that deaths. That. I think 20 deaths in total, a number injured. There were injured on the Chinese side as well, but this is an old border dispute, Mike. This goes back to, uh, I, I think we're going to lay the blame at the feet of the British Empire yes. <laughs> for the uh, map making exercise. Um, when India gained its independence as well, and a lot of these countries were being formed and the borders were being formed. But that's a major thoroughfare from China to Tibet, and that's also a contested region uh, uh, between India and China. Yeah, absolutely. So many people asking, what will this mean for uh, Indian Chinese diplomacy? What will it mean, more importantly, for Indian and Chinese trade? Because uh, uh, India is, I think, probably the, I think India is the largest importer of Chinese goods on the planet. Um, so where that leaves that, we don't know, but certainly it's not great in terms of uh, Chinese external relations. Uh, and then, uh, as we mentioned on Wednesday's programme, on Wednesday and Thursday this week, we had the uh, NATO Defence Minister's meeting. Uh, and as you can see, they're all social distancing. They're not wearing any masks, mind you, but they are uh, socially distancing. So they're staying two metres apart, apparently. Uh, and here's another image of the room as they all stay two metres apart. I don't know, Mike. It looks like one and a half metres to me. Uh, I don't think that's a full two metres, especially those two on the left-hand side. I think they should be fined. Well, uh, absolutely, uh, well, quite possibly. Now, of course, uh, this follows on from NATO, the announcement of NATO 2030, which is uh, moving uh, NATO's interests uh, perhaps less on the European theatre and more on the Southeast Asian theatre. So they're wanting to get Australia, New Zealand and so on involved. Uh, because uh, they want to encircle China as well as Russia. Uh, so what were they talking about here? Uh, they were talking about deterrence and defence concept for NATO, which sets out a framework for their military activity in response to threats across land, air, sea, and so on. This is the usual rhetoric. Uh, they wanted to address Russia's uh, deployment of new intermediate range missiles. So they're still concerned about the threat of Russia. Uh, they uh, were discussing uh, the nuclear deterrent that NATO has control of. Uh, and so there was a meeting of the nuclear planning group to discuss how to ensure uh, nuclear deterrent remains safe, secure and effective uh, and so on. But of course, a large portion of this, uh, Patrick, was about burden sharing. Uh, so we'll just come back to Donald Trump for one moment, because, of course, he was talking about removing 10,000 troops out of Germany, reducing the uh, U.S. contingent in Germany to 25,000. Uh, nobody should have been surprised by that announcement uh, because this uh, Trump has been banging the uh, fair burden sharing within NATO drum 
since 2016, since he was, his first visit to, the, to, to open the new NATO headquarters in, uh, in Brussels, if you remember. Uh, and uh, so he's been talking about this for years. The uh, EU have until, or the EU countries have until um, 2024 to put in their full 2% of GDP into defence. There's still no sign of them actually moving terribly quickly towards that target. So this is him attempting to keep the pressure on. And that's really all it is. Now, he said that he was removing troops from Syria and it didn't happen. He said he's going to remove troops from Germany. I don't think it's going to happen. But if it does, the Polish are extremely keen for him to move the troops into Poland. Into po okay, Ab so, absolutely. so out of Germany, 10,000 and then 10,000 into Poland. Uh, I think if, if they're going to go anywhere, that's probably where they're going to go. Yes. Yeah. Well, with, with through, the last thing I'll say, Mike, through the NATO uh, countries and all the different sites and uh, fields and training, uh, they've got drills and training th things going on every week now these yes, days. Absolutely. It'd be very easy to disperse uh, a few thousand American troops rotating around different countries doing different exercises. So it's uh, it, a lot of it's a, a shell game in terms of numbers. But what does it mean in terms of uh, NATO? What does it mean in terms of European defense? Does this mean that... Uh, is, is there any competition between NATO and the potential EU defense uh, with regards to, you know, who is going to be responsible for the security of Europe? Uh, well, these are all good questions and everything seems to be in flux. And as we mentioned in the program, I think of Wednesday or Monday, uh, the, the, the Brexit negotiations uh, go reinvigorated at the moment. Uh, and it looks very much like the UK's involvement in EU defense is going to be one of the key bargaining chips for a trade deal that comes out of that. So they want the UK in. They want the UK in. The UK wants an independent trade deal where, where the UK is seen as a, as a sovereign uh, equal to the EU. It doesn't want to be under EU rules with respect to trade because we want to do trade deals under this new Global Britain tagline uh, mm -hmm. with other countries. We've just started negotiations with Australia by coincidence on, the, on with respect to trade. We've got negotiations going on in the United States with respect to trade. Uh, and the, the, the UK's defence is going to be the bargaining chip that's used to get this trade deal with the EU. So, so um, EU defence are very much in a state of flux at the moment. It's very important that people keep an eye on that. Uh, and NATO's relationship uh, is going to be part and parcel of that as well. And, but, where, and where is the US going to sit in that? Because its old levers of control and power might be dissipated somewhat. NATO's not going away, of course. No, no, but the US, I think, will be very, very keen to see NATO pursue this 2030 agenda and see NATO in South, Southeast Asia, in the in South China Sea and so on. This would be this would be something that the US would support. Yeah, absolutely. So the new gambit is, is containing China, is uh, yes. enclosing China, as uh, they have Russia on the uh, on Russia's western border. Absolutely. Europe's, yeah, absolutely. Uh, we'll leave it there for today. Thank you very much for joining us today, Patrick. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we will be back at the same time, 1 p.m. on Monday as usual. Have a great weekend and we will see you then. Bye bye.